Okay. So hi folks, welcome to the graphics programming virtual meetup. We uh, meet up meet weekly and we usually talk about uh, books or tutorials, but for the last week and this week we are doing some project presentations. Uh, we follow the Berlin Code of Conduct. We have a Discord server that you can join. And we also have a Twitter account that we will post or have announcement of new meetings. And we have a YouTube channel for all the old meetings. Yeah, and today's topic is CUDA blocking simulation with the Boyd uh, Live program. Now, some credit first is uh, University of Pennsylvania's uh, CS 565 course. I'm not affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania in any way. I just use that course to learn some CUDA. And their project one is about void simulation. Second uh, credit is the paper efficient neighbor searching for agent based simulation on GPU, which goes a little bit beyond of the scope of this course project and provides some uh, ideas on how to optimize GPU based uh, neighbor searching. So what is void simulation? Boy, a void is basically a little agent that move by themselves. And when we have a lot of voids, they kind of form a flock and they, they just move in some interesting patterns. And there are three rules of void that those rules are often have some conflict with each other that cause void to move in some interesting patterns. The first rule is called separation. The idea is that if we have a bunch of boys boy nearby our boys, then those bunch of boys will try to repel our boys away uh, because our boys do not want to be overcrowded. Notice all of the boys have this concept of a sphere of influence. If something is outside of the distance, they do not have any uh, impact on, the, on our void. And we just run this process on all of the void. And it's a double for loop. We run the process on all the voids, and for each void, we run it on all the neighbors. The pseudocode is like this. So separation rule for each void, we loop through all the other voids. If they are not themselves and they are close to our little voids, then we repel them away from the neighbor voids a little bit. The, se the second idea, uh, second rule is the alignment rule. So the velocity of each individual void are uh, trying to steer towards the velocity of the neighbor void. The pseudocode is very similar. We need to calculate the average velocity. And, and because we are calculating the average, we also need to accumulate the count. And afterward, if the count is greater, sorry, this should be greater than zero, then we need to divide by the count to get the average. And the third rule is the cohesion rule, where our void is trying to uh, steer towards the center of mass of the neighbor void. This rule is kind of kind of uh, conflict with the first rule, but think this way in like particle simulations with a bunch of particles, then they are far away, they kind of uh, impact each other through gravity. And so they kind of attract each other, but when they are too close, they start to repel each other. It's the same kind of idea here. And that's why I draw those, this sphere a bit larger than the rule one sphere because uh, the separation rule, uh, so we don't necessarily have the same distance for the three different rules to get interesting effects. And the pseudocode is also 
Also, almost the same, just calculate the center of mass by accumulating all the mass and then divide by the neighbor's count. And then trying to make our board steer toward the center of mass. With all those three parts, we can have our void algorithm. Pretty simple. We just have a nested for loop. Uh, this is this for parallel uh, syntax in the pseudo code means I want to launch a CUDA uh, kernel to do the stuff because um, just just we can. You can use, use CUDA to get uh, way better performance than sequential code. And inside the kernel, we need to loop through all the voids again to accumulate the new velocity and then get the new velocity. Since we have uh, like this nested for loop, uh, we have this big O N square algorithm for void. This can be a bad news, even though we like to say big O uh, doesn't matter. But when it's n square and we have a large data size, then it certainly matters because our uh, runtime can grow rapidly when we increase the void size. This update position is just uh, explicit Euler algorithm where we say position is equal to velocity time. Uh, position is equal to the old plus position plus the velocity times the time step. Uh, in the last meeting, I just mentioned that explicit Euler is not uh, very numerical stable, but for the board simulation, it's fine. And also, it's the simplest thing to implement. We also do bubble pinpoint. It is very common to do this kind of thing with GPU compute to have multiple buffers because when we're calculating the new uh, velocity, we still need the information of old velocity and we cannot mutate the old velocity in place. So we need this kind of buffer. But we also don't want to do like in functional programming, we just allocate and allocate, allocate new buffers every time. We don't want to do that. So we, we instead, we always have an old buffer and new buffer. We use old buffer to generate a new buffer and at the end, swap those two buffers. And, and then we can step again. Uh, this kind of thing should be familiar if you are uh, familiar with GPU uh, compute programming or like the concept of uh, double buffering, for example. Uh, with our void implementation so far, it's pretty good. We can run tens of thousands of void without trouble. It's already pretty impressive. Uh, a lot of GLSL implementation of void probably just stopped there, but we can go a little bit further than that with uh, grid as an optimization. So every time you see a bunch of all objects, uh, kind of this kind of uh, distributed in space. One way, one way to accelerate in the algorithm is to use some kind of accelerating data structure. And he, in this case, we just use uniform grid because it is simple to implement on GPU, or like an oak tree, which may be faster on CPU, but on GPU, it's just harder to implement. And what we do is to split partition the space into uniform grid. And we also need to linearize our grid and just assign each grid with some IDs. And then we will use this ID information later. After we have that, how do we fi find the neighbor grid of uh, our void? So, for void seven, if we want to find all the neighbor voids, we do not need to search void in uh, grid six, for example. We only need to search them in, in grid, uh, grid five, four, zero, and one. And of course, not all the voids in those four grids will be, uh, will be actually uh, 
the neighbor of seven, for example, six is not a neighbor of seven, but we can eliminate a lot parts that we do not need to search. Similarly, for these two, uh, this uh, point two, we only need to search grid 10, 11, 14, and 15. Uh, how to calculate the grid index of that? Um, we don't use the of nine neighbor grids in 2D or like 27 neighbor uh, cells in 3D, instead we only use four. The way to do that is, for example, in this case, we calculate the grid index by floating points like this one we will get one point something, uh, one point something, one point something that then we round them into one one. And then if we subtract one one, uh, one by each of them, we get zero zero and we can say, we get zero zero, one, uh, zero one, one zero and one one. Similarly for this one, this one, we, when we calculating them by floating point, we get two point something, but it's point uh, something is greater than five, point five. So when we run them, we actually get this point, three, uh, three, three. So when we subtract, we get two, two here. And then, then when we try to expand them into all the grid, our neighbor's grid, we get 10, 11, 14, 15. So it's a simple trick to, calculate this uh, or the neighborhood of a single point. And now the problem is how to store the grid cells. We certainly cannot use a vector of vectors on GPU, even on CPUs that can be slow, for example, why libraries like tiny OPG loader is comparable slower than some other faster OPG loaders because they use this kind of like nested allocation. So instead uh, we need a kind of flatten uh, allocation that just uh, encode all the information. First, so first we assign each void with some grid ID, for example, six, For example, six have a grid ID of zero, and zero have grid ID of six. Notice the voids are unsorted at start. So we just assign the void ID linearly and calculate their grid ID. Afterwards, we will sort them based on grid ID. So this way we get this, we get this array of Zero, five, 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 six, seven, eight, ten, ten, uh, thirteen, or something. Uh, but the idea is, if you look at this kind of array, you immediately think about one length encoding. So we can encode this. We can import this information of grids kind of implicitly. With if we have this kind of sorted array. And to sort them, there is this thrust library, which is, is awesome. Uh, thrust is an STL-like library that provides a bunch of STL algorithms. But it also provides some more algorithms like sort by key, which does not exist in uh, C++ standard library, but it works really well with this kind of SLA data structures where we have multiple arrays of the same data. Notice that our actual data of void is still not sorted. We use this void ID array to identify the actual data, which will cause one in direction and we will fix them later. With with this kind of uh, this kind of sorted grid ID array, then we can simply generate this grid first and grid last array, where grid first and uh, where grid ID and zero here. So the grid first is zero of zero is zero. Grid last of zero is zero. One two three four does not have any 
four is in them, so we just have some dummy value negative one in them. And for five, we have we have one, two, three. So we start from one and end at three, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. With with those two array as a first and last array as representation, we can actually do, when we say what is the void in a grid cell, we can just we can just loop through. We can just loop through this from one to three, which is just one to one to three. So, so uh, also the book, no, sorry, not the book, the paper called those two arrays begin and end, which is really odd from a C++ programmer's perspective. So I changed them to first and last. Uh, here is the pseudo code. The first step is com compute the indices. As we said before, the the uh, void indices are just a uh, sequence of numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, generated by IOTA. And the grid indices, we calculated them by calculating the, their three from position calculate their like three dimensional grid indices and then linearize them. Then, then we sort them by key, find the first and last array. Then the then in our main kernel, main kernel, first for each point we get all the neighbor cells. Then we look through the neighbor cells, get all the neighbors inside that particular neighbor cell and then calculate the position and the velocity of the neighbor and use our three rules that accumulate the result. The remaining part is the same. Notice this indirection here which can cause a little, little bit of performance loss and later by sorting the actual data we can avoid this. So the next step is to cut the middle man that uh, indices array. So what if our void is already sorted like this from zero, one, two, three, four, five, etc. That the order of voids is the order of the grid. So naively, you probably just want to do this, not naively, just intuitively. That's, that's the thing I want to do. I want to sort by key of grid in, use grid indices as a key and with the position and velocity as values. Notice we don't need to separate uh, array to, st to store the sorted positions and the sorted velocities in this case, because the original position is still useful later. Unfortunately, uh, thrust does not, does not support this kind of variadic uh, sort. And so instead, uh, thrust have another algorithm called gather, which basically means we gather the position by these indices. And then since indices sorted, as a result, the position and the velocity will get sorted. Uh, you can read the documentation of gather and scatter for more information on how that works. And the pseudo code is still almost the same for here, except for here we need to we sort position and velocity directly. And for here we don't have indirections anymore. Also, since we created additional sorted buffers, our, uh, our buffer pinpointing swapping changed a little bit that we, know, we not only we need to uh, swap the velocity, we also need to swap the positions. The last step I want to talk about is shared memory optimization as mentioned in that paper. 
This, this is a topic trickier than I initially thought. I initially just thought to shove some data into shared memory and magic. But in reality, it's pretty hard to find what data to send into shared memory. So to understand what is going on with shared memory, we need to have some understanding of the CUDA compute model. Uh, don't worry if you cannot understand this part. It is this is pretty tricky, and I, when I first learned this, I spent quite a lot of time to understand it. Uh, first, for CUDA thread hierarchy, so we probably think about heterogeneous computation as g just a bunch of threads running in parallel, but that is an oversimplified assumption. Instead, CUDA, CUDA devices at least have this hierarchy of thread. First, there is block where each block contains a bunch of threads. All those threads in a block run in parallel. They are unsynchronized, and you can explicitly synchronize them with fences. The other thing is they can share memory usage, which is called shared memory, of course, and that, that is our topic. And then, then there is grid. Each grid contains a lot of blocks. And however, blocks do not share memories other than the global memory. So each block contains their own shared memory, but blocks do not share some kind of shared memory. Now let's talk about CUDA memories. For CUDA memories, first we have global memory, just like the global memory on CPU. They are large but slow off chip. There is also local memories, which is actually reside on the memory space of global memories, even though, even though they, even though they, uh, their scope is inside each individual thread. When you create a CUDA buffer, it's a global memory. When you create uh, some kind of array in the kernel, then you are creating local memories. Both of them are pretty slow. There's a constant memory, which is faster, but it's read only, so not useful for our purpose where we want to have uh, multiple arrays. There's also registers and shared memories. Those memories are on chip for each individual block and they are fast. Registers are uh, not shared between different threads in a block. And uh, they are for like small automatic storage duration objects like for example, int and floats in the kernel. And shared memory is this relatively larger chunk of memory that's shared across all the threads in a block. And they are also fast even though it's still very small compared to the global memory. So shared memory is like the cache on CPU, but instead of cache, we have no control of, and we can just uh, be aware of cache locality. With shared memory, it is a scratch pad memory that we explicitly load uh, data into them and use them to add some, do some calculation and then copy the data back into the global memory. They're called scratch pad because they can, shared memory can only be used for temporary uh, purpose. You cannot use shared memory as persistent storage because when the kernel is gone, the shared memory is gone. So the idea of shared memory op uh, optimization is to shuffle all the neighbor grids of a walk, which is all a thread in when execution of the block. So we want to shuffle all neighbor scripts of a warp to shared memory. So let's see our warp contains one, seven, and five. Then all, all the all the voids in those nine cells are relevant to, to this uh, warp. So we will put all of them into the shared memory except our shared memory is not large enough to accommodate all of them. 
So instead, what we will do is using a while loop, we process a little chunk at a time. It's a little chunk, copy to shared memory, process them, and this little chunk, copy to uh, shared memory, process them, and et cetera, et cetera, until we're done with this whole block, and then we're done. So the pseudocode is, Pseudocode is almost identical except the main kernel. In the main kernel, we have this, we have this kind of, um, for each warp, we need to first calculate all the neighbor bridge cells in a warp, and then we do some synchronization, then we copy some points in neighbor cells to share memory. But since shared memory is small, we need to copy them based on capacity, and after, and then later we need to do this process again to copy more. We have this inner parallel loop, which is, does not exist in actual CUDA code. This two parallel loop is just an artifact I want to show as the CUDA spread hierarchy. Instead, in the actual CUDA code, it's just some boundary of fences at each, at each point. And and then, and then in, inside the inner loop, we are also doing exactly the same thing, except this time we read all the data from the shared memory. So we avoid to use the to use the expensive global memory inside the inner loop. So even though even though our loop is still n square of operations, but we only have they go n of reading from the global memory. That's vastly reduced how much global memory read we have. And here's like demo time. So, all four algorithms look like exactly the same. They don't have much differences except the speed, so I will not show I will not showcase them. And in, in here each particle each particle is represents the velocity. Uh, the color of particles represents the velocity, so like velocity vector. I do plan to later use instance rendering to, and render some kind of airplane or birds instead of just particles, but I just haven't done that yet. We can even have more, like a million particles. Then the program still runs reasonably really fast, not 60 frames per second anymore. I don't know if it's because of Zoom, uh, but we have too, too many particles to be like visually appealing anymore. Yeah, that's, that's a presentation. Any questions? If there are no questions, I will end the recording. Okay, there's one in chat. How long did it take to uh, take to learn how to program with CUDA calls? Uh, I learned this stuff like just following that course and doing uh, reading some books in, in like a month, like not a long time. But I do have experience with this, uh, some other parallel computing stuff before, like uh, computers or SQL, but CUDA is kind of a new word for me. 
So I, I'm not an expert. I still need to learn a lot of stuff in Kuga. So I cannot say like how much time you, you can spend to become very good at CUDA. Any other questions? Hey, Leslie, this is Orhan. Oh, hi, Orhan. Uh, I want to ask, uh, how about instead of CUDA, other compute engines like, I don't know, OpenGL, Vulkan, DirectX? Uh, yeah, so the thrust part is, I think, what really shine in CUDA. You can just do something like, well, not this, but yeah, do something like this. Where you, in GLSL, it's a bit tricky because you need to write your own like Redux sort or whatever sort, for example. And so this kind of thing is a productive deep boost for CUDA that I don't know if it's available in SQL, but definitely not in GLSL. Yeah, I was going to ask about SQL too. Uh, do you know any libraries that can do these? I, I think so, but I, I haven't looked them too closely. Okay. Yeah, I'm really interested in SQL, but I, in terms of, I haven't looked into it really well. But yeah, I, 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 could I be being NVIDIA only just makes me, mm, I want, just I want a more general solution that works especially on Intel CPUs or ARM CPUs or something or yeah. CPU. It is really nice, but it is also like its own language. Uh, it's all like NVIDIA only is one thing. It's also like CUDA is its own language. All the C++ code will, will not directly work with CUDA. You need to add this uh, device like keyword to make them work with CUDA. Yeah, uh, that, that was one of the things. Uh, I was thinking about if NVIDIA, that one of the things come to me, came to my mind when I heard NVIDIA might buy ARM. Oh, are we going to have CUDA on ARM? <laughs> that would be nice, yeah. <laughs> or something, I don't know. Um, yeah, but I, isn't that uh, ARM, most of the phones or mobile, uh, mobile devices uh, might have other GPUs, right? It, it's, it might not be ARM only. Um, I think there are some mobile CUDA GPUs. I think like the NVIDIA, maybe it was the NVIDIA Tegra or the Kepler. Yeah, 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 that, that, that has CUDA. But yeah. I think that they have a separate unit. It's not in the, I don't know, I really don't know the real arch hardware architecture in that case. Yeah. From my understanding, the Tegra and uh, you know, the thing that's in the Switch is, much less mobile and more its own class than a yeah. akin to a proper cell phone type hardware platform. Yeah. Still ARM, still mobile, just a different, you know, space, if you, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Good. Any other questions? Yes. Um, Luke just asked another one. Oh, in the chat? Yes. A lot of chats. Can we report to um, um, in regard to void and CUDA? Which part of the void simulation both on the benefits from parallel competition? Uh, what do you mean which part? Like void simulation is a very simple algorithm. And it is very parallel by nature, like every void is self-acting agent. The other good thing is we can use the spatial locality of the voids. Like for example, for that's for those for those voids, we don't need to consider the void here. That's how we can do uh, shared memory optimizations. Uh, I don't know if it's possible to do this kind of thing like GLSL, for example. 
I think we can have an extension for that, but I just yeah, know the, the subgroups there. can do something similar, I believe. They're just probably not as nice to use. Yeah. Um, uh, he, uh, Luke further added, is it, is it just that you can compute multiple areas in parallel? Each Boyd is computed individually from all of the others for every time step. Yeah, so, exactly. So there's no, there's no like, I have to compute Boyd 1 before Boyd 2 and before Boyd 3. That's what the double buffering allows you to do. In yeah. Fact, yeah. It's kind of a necessity so that you can do everything in parallel without trampling on each other's work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, double buffering, uh, like you were saying, that does come up a lot. Uh, it's very similar to how I uh, did the stuff for the soft body of physics. Uh, you've got a, a previous set of values and a, a next set of values. So you're reading from one and writing to the other each time. Yeah, physics simulation is another good example of double buffering. And and also uh, the the voxel thing that I've, uh, that I've got, kind of uh, been working on, um, the way that the drawing functions work, uh, there's two copies of the uh, voxel buffer, and it's um, one's read from, one's written to. Uh, when you when you do those operations, yeah. What's annoying is that the the concept of triple buffering is related, but in a lot of ways not the same thing. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Uh, let's see. Double buffering allows you to do what exactly? Uh, let me. It's kind of a synchronization. Uh, uh, well, prevents, um, what is it? Uh, what certain is classes of hazards. Point, yeah. Can you, see, can you see this? Like this drawing software, I'm opening it. The loading screen, yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Let's see, we have a simple program where each, where each uh, time, the, the cell becomes the sum of itself and its neighbors, like three, uh, six, five. If we have a single buffer, the problem is when we write this cell to three, then we can no longer co calculate this cell, right? And in functional programming, the way of doing stuff is to not mutate. Instead, we just always allocate new buffers, always allocate new buffers. That's all. So it's a, yeah. it's a read after write. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's not ideal. So what we do is we, we write into this buffer, and then we write back into this buffer back and forth. Uh, a, a very old example of double buffering is, and you'll see this all over the place in lit, quote unquote literature, um, but in old consoles and computers, the graphics driver, which wasn't a driver like we think of today. It was the thing that was uh, get, that was the place where all the video memory was located so that the VGA, the CRT computer monitor, would be reading from it. And the problem was is if you were writing your graphics to the frame buffer while the, while the CRT computer or CRT monitor was reading from it, you would be able to see the, the data as the graphics as it was being drawn every frame, which would look terrible. So yeah. to fix that, you have two frame buffers and on one frame you write, you read from buffer zero 
so the CRT is reading the memory in buffer zero because it's just reading it linearly left to right up top to bottom while in the buffer B you are drawing your graphics whatever and whenever the CRT is done drawing the old frame it switches to the next buffer and ping pongs back and forth so that you're always drawing on the buffer that is not being read from so that you don't see the artifacts of the drawing as it's being rendered. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a read after write hazard yeah. that you're, you're solving. Tri triple this. buffering is a way of hiding latency. It does not make anything faster. You're, yeah, the, the, yeah, just link this. You need to, yeah, just, this is a much better description than a. Yeah, this is, this is a good resource on the topic. Yeah. Double buffering come can yeah. the term comes from the, like the graphics drivers of old, but it's it's not anything specific to displays or anything. It's a lot. It, functional programming uses it, like Leslie was mentioning, to allow for this kind of computation to this, take place. It's really imperative concept. I think just we because we the functional programming allows no mutation at all. Instead, we like no mutation, no synchronization, everything's nice, but we need to allocate all the time. <laughs> and uh, double buffering is maybe makes this compromise that we only mutate and synchronize around these two pointers and then everything else is not. I think I'm, my explanation is literally parroting what the article is saying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it just, you write, you change the pointers. You have a variable that stores which is the current read buffer and which is the current write buffer. And every time you read from the buffer, you read from this pointer. And every time you write from the buffer, you read from, you read that pointer to write to the memory address that you need. And the, the, mem the pointer is the beginnings of the buffers. Yeah. So yeah, it's like having two arrays and pointers to the beginning of them. And every time you step your simulation, your whatever you're doing, you uh, switch those two pointers around. Um, what is the mechanism that switch between buffers? But we, we just swap the pointers, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, another, like when, um, I was talking about the voxel project. It's it's two different texture units, so it's it's just the the integer identifier for the extra unit. Are there any vertices to draw in these buffers? Uh, we we draw the position buffers. Uh, yeah, we also draw the velocity buffers. Sorry, as color. Yeah, so we do draw we do draw those data. So, but. Yeah, since we're always, our pointer will always point to the correct front buffer, that's not a problem. How how big is your uniform grid? I, I forgot to ask. Um, what's the uh, resolution of your uniform grid? Uh, so the, the resolution of uniform grid is calculated by the, uh, the distance. We have this kind of distance, whatever. Oh, so it varies. The distance is a constant expert variable. It doesn't varies. At least it doesn't varies in one run. Grid side. Yeah, we just calculate because because we like if our base is two times the like maximum of distance, we know that when we have when we have like this this uh void three for example, void three will never need to calculate anything in like grid fifteen. Mm -hmm. The source code is online somewhere, right? Yeah, I haven't finished the readme. Okay. Other other thing is good. Uh, uh, I, I mainly ask because some of these questions can are I'm not it's not saying 
Yeah. Read the code and answer your own question. I'm, I'm just saying oh, at some point we're going to want to end the recording. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah, I guess that is. Yeah, I will put the link there. I haven't finished the readme, but I should have a, at least have a build instruction. So, yeah. Sounds good. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Or I will end the recording. Okay, good. So, wait, there's more questions? I was just re I, um, just replying to Luke. Okay, uh, I'll end the recording.